1923, a Delaware housewife named Celia Steele received a surprise in the mail. As the story goes, she had ordered 50 chickens to be delivered to her home. She wanted to raise them on her property so she could have meat and eggs and sell some to the neighbors. Nice idea, right? But instead of 50 chickens, Celia received 500. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> she could have panicked, especially considering the average flock size at that time was just 23 birds. She could have killed off the extra ones and put all that pot pie in the freezer. But instead, this enterprising amateur farmer held on to the entire flock of 500 and even managed to keep them alive through the harsh northeastern winter. <laughs> then, taking advantage of developments in chicken feed supplements, she kept expanding after that. Three years later, in 1926, she had 10,000 birds. And nine years after that, Steele was managing an operation of a quarter of a million chickens, demonstrating new possibilities for large-scale animal agriculture. It's an impressive story of growth, but we bet even Celia would be surprised by how chicken farming has changed since then. That one mistake in delivery, uh, less than 100 years ago, fundamentally changed the way that we raise chickens for food in this country. Our system today raises over 9 billion chickens every year. These chickens are confined in numbers ranging upwards of three quarters of a million. Pigs, cows, and even fruits and vegetables are now raised on a similarly massive scale. This is industrialized agriculture. We grow a lot of food on huge farms as cheaply as possible. There are upsides to growing so much food so cheaply, namely making sure that every one of us can afford to feed ourselves and our families but we pay for cheap food in many other ways. The costs of industrialized agriculture affect each and every one of us. There's the environment. According to the UN, animal agriculture is one of the major causes of climate change. The EPA says it's the number one polluter of our water, the number two polluter of our air. It degrades our land and leads to loss of biodiversity. Then there are the economic issues. Big corporations drive out and take over small independent farmers. Just Four companies control 60% of our nation's poultry. They're huge corporations, and they're focused on efficiency and cutting costs. When workers in slaughterhouses are forced to slaughter chickens at the speed of 140 birds per minute, it's cruel to the chickens. It's dangerous for the workers, and the mess it creates has a hazardous effect on our health. Food contamination is a real problem with serious public health ramifications. With our industrial scale of agriculture, food's shipped all over the world, so contamination at one factory or one farm can affect millions of people. The last big outbreak of E. coli in packaged spinach caused recalls in 39 states. The list of ways that industrialized agriculture affects us goes on and on. And there are experts in all of those fields who could tell us even more about why we need to turn away from big farming. The next question is how. That's why we're here today. My name is Irene, and this is my sister Margaret. And together with our brother Andy, we own and operate the May May Group here in Boston. As you can probably tell, we've loved food our entire lives. <laughs> but we each come from different academic and professional backgrounds. My brother Andy studied psychology and then explored the field of hospitality here in Boston. Margaret went to business school in London and researched innovations in technology and design. Irene studied social justice and community organizing, and along with her partner, Max, taught herself how to cook. Together, we've spent the last three years planning and running our food truck, opening a restaurant, and exploring exactly how we can reduce our dependence on industrialized agriculture. We're here today to talk about how we source, cook, and serve food that respects animals and the environment, supports small local farms and the regional economy, and provides a better life for the people who produce this food and the people who eat it. We're here today to talk about how our business, small though it may be, is making a difference in the local food system, and how together, small businesses have the power to change the way the world eats. Since opening our food truck in April 2012, we've served over 85,000 pounds of local food from small family farms and sustainable producers. That's the equivalent of 
850 pounds of delicious house-made bacon for each person in this room. Most people don't think of food trucks or restaurants as major forces for positive change. And we didn't either, at least not at first. But we were curious to see how much of our money could go towards people living and working in our communities who are producing food the right way. So we committed to buying only local pasture-raised meat. We purchased all of our free-range eggs from a single farm outside of Providence, Rhode Island. We sourced all our major produce from farms in the Northeast. And the more money we spent, the more we realized that our experiment in local sourcing was starting to have a real impact. Every day, we have to make decisions about what ingredients to buy, and from where, and from whom. We want our buying choices to make good business sense, but we want them to reflect our values as well. If we can choose an option that's cleaner, or healthier, or more equitable, we believe we have the opportunity to make a difference. The way we see it, it's a little bit like that Gandhi quote. You know the one from the bumper sticker? <laughs> we cook and serve the food that we want to see in the world. And we've proven that we can stay in business while doing it. Let's take a look at 2013, the year that we really ramped up our food truck operations and opened our restaurant in Boston in November. During this year, we spent $100,000 on food from small family farms and local producers. And one of our first sourcing partners was Aiden from John Crow Farm in Groton, Massachusetts. We have an item on our menu called the John Crow Farm Rib and Belly Pork Chop with house-made steam buns, sauces, pickles, and it is a big dish. But what's even bigger is that at John Crow Farm, the animals roam freely and they're cared for with respect. This is a picture of Irene with a 400-pound sow that we bought for a special event. All of her delicious fat, the pigs obviously, <laughs> <laughs> came from the natural care that she received and the life that she led. It is a world away from the industrial system, where most pigs are confined in crates so small that they can't turn around and are treated as a unit of meat farmed for profit. Your average pig farm these days is about 10,000 pigs. And farmers produce at this scale, this scale because restaurants and supermarkets require massive quantities of just the most popular cuts of meat. You see a lot of pork tenderloin on menus and in supermarkets. If a chain restaurant serves pork tenderloin on its menu across its 2,000 locations nationwide, farmers might have to provide 50,000 pigs worth of pork tenderloin to supply that restaurant chain for one week. How do we even raise that many pigs? The answer is you do it quickly and you do it cheaply because that's what fast food demands. It's a complex situation and it's tough to get these corporations to change. We see them a bit like ocean liners headed down on their course. They're, they're too busy and they're focused on where they're going to listen to the voices of a few concerned citizens. Our business, small, we try to be more nimble, like a sailboat that can adjust depending on the way the wind is blowing. We can listen to the demands of the marketplace and focus on the needs of our suppliers in addition to our own. What this looks like for us is buying whole pigs, not just pork tenderloins. And when we decided that we were going to serve pork on our food truck, we felt that we needed to understand what it meant to butcher a pig. So Irene watched a lot of videos on YouTube and taught herself how to butcher. <laughs> Classic modern education. And she went to the farmer's market and the next day come, came back after having met Aiden from John Crow for the first time. And the next day we received a surprise delivery of our own, a 250 pound pig to our mom's house when our mom was on vacation in Jamaica. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Sorry, Mom. Uh, it was an eye-opening experience, to say the least, having an enormous pig spread eagled on our kitchen table. But it really gave us a sense of what the needs of our farmers were. And we understood how much work it took for Aiden to break down this pig into hundreds of pieces, package and label each one, take them all to the farmer's market, and then work all day to sell them each piece to a different consumer. We make it work for the farmer. And that allows us to support a company that's doing good business and making sure that our needs are met in addition. And having whole pigs at our restaurant, we break down one every week, means that we can have a much more creative and an unusual menu. So by being flexible and looking for creative solutions, we can support another business doing things the right way. It's really important to us to support businesses like these. And it's even better when we can help them grow. When we opened the restaurant last year, we formed a new partnership so that we could serve poultry, like the chicken in our Five Spheres chicken dish. 
This dish is really exciting for us because we never serve chicken off the food truck. We made that decision because pasture-raised options were too expensive for that price point, and we didn't want to serve any factory farmed meat. This is particularly tough when you consider how much the three of us siblings love to eat chicken wings. <laughs> so enter Vince and Elizabeth Frary, the fourth generation family farmers who recently opened Copacut Farms in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. They're proud to sell humanely treated birds at farmers markets across the state. And when we met them, we were thrilled. The life of a chicken or turkey at Copacut Farms is basically pastured paradise. The birds live outside and have constant access to fresh air, grass, and insects. What more could you want? <laughs> the birds are also slaughtered carefully by hand on the farm. No factories where workers are killing animals at a rate of 140 per minute. We actually spent a day slaughtering chickens at a similar farm to get an idea of what's involved in the process. I had never killed an animal before, and I was shaking the whole time. But what I learned that day is that this type of careful, safe, and humane slaughter requires a lot of work. And it's worth supporting because we believe in what these farmers are doing. We're Copacut's first restaurant account, but we know we won't be their last because they've had such a successful year. We bought every last chicken they raised. <laughs> so next year, they're going to build new chicken houses, including one just for us. And one chicken house may not seem like a big deal, but to Elizabeth and Vince and to our company, it's amazing. They know that they'll have an outlet for those birds, and we know that we'll have a steady supply of chickens for the restaurant. It's a symbiotic relationship that allows all of us to increase our ability to provide good food to more consumers, and it's a ripple effect. As Elizabeth says, we believe Meime will demonstrate that providing healthy, locally grown food to customers is a business model that is both responsible and financially sustainable. And we both hope that other businesses will see what we've done and follow suit. Small businesses together can comprise a network that can help everyone succeed. And small businesses like ours are helping each other thrive. We love working with individual farmers like Vince, Aiden, and Elizabeth. It's helped keep factory farmed pork and factory farmed chicken out of our restaurant. <laughs> but if you come look in our restaurant refrigerators, you'll see that there isn't much factory farmed anything, and that's where the importance of local food infrastructure comes into play. Our carrots and seeds dish features carrots from Chartner Farms, herbs from Indie Growers, cranberries from Fresh Meadows Farm, and ricotta from Narragansett Creamery. But instead of seeking out and coordinating delivery with each one of these farms, we work with an organization called Market Mobile. They run farmers markets in the state of Rhode Island, and they aggregate and distribute products from over 50 small farms. So what that means is the local farmers head to the Providence Farmers Market, and they bring their restaurant orders with them. Market Mobile organizes them and brings them to us. And this is amazing because farmers, they don't have to have a fancy website or an additional sales team or an extra delivery driver or a truck. We get to go online late at night after service, access a wide variety of local foods, get one invoice, pay with one check, and the product arrives like clockwork. Everyone saves time, gas, and money, and we can pass those savings on to our guests. Honestly, it's kind of like magic. <laughs> Market Mobile has grown every year. They've put more and more local food into grocery stores, restaurants, schools, and hospitals. They've created good jobs and added acres of farmland back to our region. They've helped small farmers stay visible and relevant in the age of social media. And we've helped them by spending about $80,000 to date. Our orders are big and consistent, and our demand is helping those small farmers stay engaged. It's convincing them to keep doing what they're doing and to build more greenhouses and more beehives. And we believe that if Market Mobile can offer their products more affordably and more dependably, then sourcing local and making those good decisions becomes a realistic option for more chefs. Market Mobile is catalyzing the development of those symbiotic relationships that help all of us grow. They're showing that local food infrastructure can be so robust that it actually supplants parts of the industrial supply chain. As they say, only 1% of the food most of us consume is grown locally, but that's 99% opportunity that our network is tackling together. Wendell Berry, the American novelist, activist, and farmer, introduced us the idea of farming by proxy. And what he meant is that we all can't be let off the hook and ignore what goes on in farms. 
we're all responsible because we all eat. And we can only eat if the land is farmed on our behalf by somebody, somewhere, in some fashion. What kind of farming is happening on your behalf? We can answer these questions by asking where your food comes from, requesting better options, and seeking out alternatives. Ask at your independent restaurants and your chain restaurants. Request better options at your dining hall and seek out alternatives to the factory farmed meat that we find in our supermarkets. It's tough and sometimes it feels like our individual efforts don't make a difference. But trust us, all of us businesses, large or small, are doing our best to earn your money. Even those large corporations, those big ocean liners, if enough people ask questions and then seek out alternatives if they don't like the answers, even those big ocean liners can be forced to change course by just a few degrees. And in the meantime, use your dollars to support the companies who are doing business the right way. All of the power of our food purchases can make sure that we're supporting the businesses that are doing good for this world. So we're starting small, and we're up against a big, entrenched system. But as Malcolm Gladwell wrote in his book, David and Goliath, much of what we consider valuable in our world arises out of just these sorts of lopsided conflicts because the act of facing overwhelming odds produces greatness and beauty. So small businesses are taking on the Goliath of large-scale industrialized agriculture. They're slowly divesting from that system and creating a new one in its place. Think back to Celia Steele. Think of how one accidental chicken delivery affected the way millions of people eat and enacted a profound cultural change. Now think of how small businesses in our communities and our region are starting a cultural change of their own to make our world healthier, more sustainable, and more equitable. Together, we can change the way the world eats. Thank you. Thank you.